How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're going to be here for the next two hours talking pro wrestling. Our guest today will be Bruce Mitchell of Pro Wrestling Torch. And uh, Brian Alvarez is not here. There was a huge earthquake in uh, the Seattle area, in Olympia, Washington, which is about an, not too far from where he lives. And I don't know if the phone lines are down, but we have been unable to contact him. So uh, right now, uh, if, if we can get him, he'll be on. But he's not here right now. So we will start with uh, we'll start with some wrestling news. Uh, let's see. Uh, I guess the first thing to talk about, uh, big story, of course, is that Jerry Lawler and the cat Stacy Carter are no longer with the World Wrestling Federation. And I'm sure most of you know the details by now. Uh, as far as that part of it goes, what happened uh, was that um, it, it, it's not exactly. I mean, it's been reported about um, angles. What I ba basically what I think happened was this current angle, which is the um, you know the cat and the right to nudity against the RTC and that program involving uh, Jerry Lawler and the cat. That was that angle was suggested by Jerry Lawler. Uh, you know, uh, for it was both an angle for himself as well as an angle uh, to get his wife Stacy Carter back on television in a prominent role, which in fact has happened. And um, as far as what happened yesterday, they there were four segments planned for last night's SmackDown show in Tucson involving them, and and uh, I presume that part of the angle um, because as as the show went on. They kind of did. Well, what would I talk? They did an angle where Val Venus had accidentally lapsed into his former persona, or or had had uh, fell victim to the pl to uh, uh, weak whatever weak will. And um, on the on the in the angle, it was like that he had had like sex with a woman, but they don't say who the woman is. And I'm presuming that that was going to mean it was going to be the cat. Um, now, they did not refuse to do that angle. In fact, Jerry Lawler may have, in fact, written that angle himself. In fact, he may very well have. But it was, the whole thing was going as it was planned. They had agreed to everything. So it was not a refusal to do anything. Uh, he left. She left. She left to go to the gym uh, with Trish Stratus. He left, I think, to go eat um, after, you know, that was all gone over. He came back. She was not back yet. And Jim Ross told him that... Uh, Vince McMahon had decided that they were going to drop the angle completely, and because of that, that she was being released. Now, obviously, there's more to the story than that. Um, what that exactly is, uh, you know, it's a little soon. I think it will. It may or may not come out. I think they may end up back. I mean, it's. But this is not an angle. This part, as far as Lawler. So anyway, Lawler got the message from Jim Ross, and. Uh, you know, Ross goes, uh, do you want to tell her, or, or, or will I tell her, you know, that she's released, basically, and, and, uh, Lawler said, I'll tell her, and then we're gonna go to back, to, and then we're gonna fly back to Memphis together. And basically, McMahon talked to him, and Ross talked to him, but Lawler, you know, quit the company, flew back home, he's home today, and that's the situation right now, as it stands. Um, Taz was in New York, um, I think that, uh, and so, so uh, he was he was not at the tapings. So they had Jim Ross do the announcing. I don't think uh, with Michael Cole for SmackDown that's going to air on uh, tomorrow night. I don't think that will be a permanent team. I think Taz is probably going to get. I'm sure he'll get one of the slots. I don't know if he's ready. The problem is, is you're talking about three slots because you've got the pay per views once a month, including Mania coming up. You got Raw, and you got SmackDown, and he's already doing Heat, and that's a lot of announcing for anyone to do and not wear thin. Especially, I don't know that Taz. In the long run, uh, I don't. I, I don't know if he's got the staying power, so to speak, to, uh, to pull this off. I guess we're gonna, we'll either find out or they're gonna get someone else. A lot of talk about Bobby Heenan. They can get Bobby Heenan if they want him. I mean, that's they. You know, the decision was made when Bobby Heenan was uh, uh, released by WCW. Um, they there was talk about Bobby Heenan, and basically Vince McMahon made the decision that they did not want Bobby Heenan, um, and that's why there was no offer made and. Or anything like that. Now, they may change their mind. They may not. I don't. You know. I don't know what. Uh, I really don't know any more about that. I haven't heard uh, much from uh, WWF as far as any official position, as far as how this affects the Memphis developmental situation, because Lawler was kind of the intermediary in that as well. Uh, nobody seems to know anything on that either. Um, there's a lot of. There's a lot of ways this thing can go. This is probably going to end up being a bigger story. Uh, then a smaller story because of the developmental thing. Um, a lot depends on, you know, again, 
uh, Lawler has a contract. If they do not release him from his contract, uh, he certainly uh, couldn't go to work for WCW if they do. Uh, it depends on what kind of a release, if it's conditional or unconditional. Um, and I don't know wh which one they would do. we got Brian here. Brian, how are you? Hey, I'm here. Oh, wow. So, what happened? My phone is, like, all screwed up, so I have no idea what's going on, but I'm here. How was the earthquake? Um, I think it's a lot worse than their, uh, or I think that uh, the coverage on the news is a lot worse than it actually is, because, I mean, I was at the gym, like, 20 minutes after the earthquake, and, you know, we're all here in Seattle, and we're just working out, and everything's all happy and everything like that, and we're sitting here watching the, uh, the big TV screens, and, um, you know, they got pictures of these buildings that have, like, collapsed and these fires and everything like that. And we're all just sitting there going, this can't be taking place in Seattle. We're here in Seattle and we don't see any of this. So, I mean, I didn't lose power or anything like that. I guess my voicemail screwed up. But, uh, I don't know. Everything's fine. Oh, okay. I, uh, well, what is the 7.0 earthquake? Yeah, it was like a 7. Actually, it was, I was, like, driving to the gym on the freeway. And, like, a year ago, I got this recall notice for my car. It's not like my steering wheel could come right off. You know, like in a cartoon, I just hand it to the passenger. And I just, like, totally ignored it. And I'm driving down the Great. freeway, and my car just started shaking. And I thought, oh, my God, my steering wheel's coming off. And uh, it turned out it was an actual an earthquake. So uh, it was pretty exciting, but far, uh, far less exciting than they're making it out to be on TV. So that's that. Well, when we had the 7, which I, I believe was a 7.1, which was, was during the World Series and I think, was it 19... 89, I'm thinking. 1989 World Series, does that sound right? Okay, sure. I was just told it was definitely 1989. That was really bad. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was real bad. Uh, I just remember the shaking and everything. Um, I was on the phone when that was going on, and I thought, I was in, the, I was living in an apartment on the second floor, and I was like, as that thing was shaking, I was going, it's, this is going down, and uh, I'm going to be buried in rubble. <laughs> I mean, it was just like, <laughs> I got under the, you know, I got under a table, you know, like they kind of teach you in school. And I go, like, this, this Which I think is, is totally down. stupid. What? Yeah, well, that's what they teach you. I just, when you panic, you just remember the last thing you were taught. And, uh, you know, then the earthquake was over, and everybody was freaking out, and then we all went outside because we didn't want to be near any buildings, and there was a million aftershocks. See, that's the other thing. On, on something that big, there's going to be a bunch of aftershocks. Well, what they said was like it was a deep earthquake, like 30 miles down, so there probably wouldn't be any uh, aftershocks. And okay. I guess because it was so deep, that's why there wasn't a lot of damage. And we're just, like, laughing at the gym because, I mean, like, our local news, they found, like, three buildings that had some damage. And so for, like, 45 minutes straight, they just keep showing these same shots of these same three buildings to make it look like Seattle's has just been leveled by this, like, Godzilla came through the city. And we're just sitting there going, yeah, this is great. This is great news. Yeah. The, they had an earthquake here, I think it was Sunday night because it was after the pay-per-view. I mean, and it was a pretty good-sized one, but I don't – it wasn't – I don't know. It, wasn't, it, was, it was enough of a deal because usually – Earthquakes are, if you don't live out here and, and don't, you know, live through, you know, a few of them every year, they're far worse. Like, people will go, how can you live out there because of the earthquakes? And believe me, I would rather live through one of those than a tornado. I mean, those things are bad. But, you know, earthquake, you know, it shakes you for about five seconds, a big one maybe 25 seconds, and then it's over. And, and you know, maybe if you have a real big one, like your, your books will be knocked off the shelf. And I think that probably... Um, you know, the one in, in 89 probably would have done that. And that's like, the, you know, in 11 years, so the books get knocked off the shelf. I mean, usually usually it's not, uh, I don't know. Hey, yeah, totally no big deal. Nothing got knocked down here. I didn't lose power. My cat didn't even freak out. It was just, okay, great. We had an earthquake. All right. Well, so then we'll talk about something that freaked out. I am far out. more embarrassed about Mardi Gras last night. I'm totally embarrassed about my city. About what? Mardi Gras. What about what, what about like riots and everything and people doing violence downtown? Oh yeah. Um, what what's what's your thoughts as far as uh, Lawler and the cat? Actually, I just put a poll up on the website last night, and um, apparently, uh, actually, I haven't even looked at the results yet. But I got an email saying that I guess a lot of people think this like a huge blow, and um, I don't it's think a, it's so much a big deal that cat's gone, but I think it's well, a big deal that Lawler's deal. gone. Because Cat being gone is not a deal at all. Yeah. Waller being gone is a big hole because... Cat I mean, him and Ross are, are just so awesome together. Yeah. And and plus, plus you know, you're talking about Raw and SmackDown and Heat. Well, you know, I mean, and pay-per-views, I mean, because Taz is doing Heat. But, I mean, that's a lot of airtime to fill. Um, maybe an opening. Who knows? I, I mean, um, just to me, it's kind of like losing Ross would be a huge deal. 
And losing Lawler would be a huge deal, but losing that combo is like almost a bigger deal. I mean, they're so great together. Yeah, there's a chemistry there. I mean, who are you going to put Ross with that's going to work with him like that? Well, the pits has on the pay-per-view, and it was a huge drop-off. Mm hmm Yeah. It's not an angle, just in case, because I got a lot of emails last night going, you know, this smells like an angle. It's not. Um, and uh, as, I, as I said, there may be a lot more that comes out of this in the next week or so. Right now, um, right, right now, actually, you know, I talked to Lawler, and he didn't really want to talk about anything right now. Um, and I haven't heard anything back from WWF on it, so I'm sure I will within the next couple of days. I think that's inevitable. I think that they're just glad to get through that TV. God, Ross had to do the TV last night. And speaking and, of uh, angles and uh, what's an angle and what's not, where in the hell is Hunter? He was on TV again last night. That's kind of weird. I don't. No, it's really weird. It's really weird, but, you know, again... I mean, no everyone you talk to goes, oh, yeah, he's just fine, everything's great, but then you think, yeah, everything's so great, he's missed TV for two days after having a great match. I think he was there, though. Yeah. He just, they just didn't put him on. It's, I, you know, who knows? Who knows? You know, maybe there's, like, something where, who, you know, they, they have some big plan. I mean, because no one's really panicking or anything about it. It just, it is very yeah, it's weird. it's not like a big story. It's just strange. I don't know. I mean, I had Monday. Monday. You know, when I thought back at that TV, Monday was, was, Monday was just so weird because they had that pay-per-view replay to hype. They had, you know, one of the better matches that they've put on in, a, in many years, and they didn't really build it up that big. And then the idea that Austin just got beat, they just, like, ignored. And it's like, you know, one of the things is, and I can blame about WCW doing this, is that when you do something that should be newsworthy and you don't hype it as being newsworthy, then it's not. And then, yeah. like, if it was a big deal that Hunter beat Austin and they've ignored it, hey, it's not, you know what, it's not a big deal. And then what that means is, is that when someone beats someone at any point in time, it's just not a big deal, and that's not what you want out of wrestling, that when someone beats someone, because then results are meaningless. And once results are meaningless, I mean, the only thing that means something is extreme angles, and you once you do that, you're going to burn people out on extreme angles real fast. Yeah. I don't think a week is going to hurt it too bad. I mean, if they do something huge with him on Monday, I think that's okay. But Oh, yeah. No, but not. I, I, I think that, no, no, okay, as far as Hunter, no, it's not going to hurt him. As far as not even mentioning the match the day after the match, I think that was a huge mistake, whether he's going to be there or not. Mm -hmm. I think that you need to go in there. I think you need to have Austin address it. Austin didn't address it. And if Austin doesn't care, then why do we as fans care? Yeah. If he's not mad that he lost, why would us as wrestling fans or Steve Austin fans be concerned that he lost? And if we're not concerned when Austin loses, because it almost never happens, and it's not a big deal, then winning and losing is not a big deal. It's not It's not good. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. So anyway, that's my thoughts on that. Uh, let's see. Um... The, the XFL vice president of sales, Bob Reardon, resigned today. Uh, he's going to the College Television Network, which I've never even heard of. <laughs> so it's not a step up? Uh, Actually, it may no. be a step up. It may be. It may, he, may, he may know something that we think we know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that, that comes uh, right after, of course, they're... they're you know, one of one of the things you know they're they're having to do make good, so a lot of the ads on the upcoming shows are going to be basically freebies. Plus, they had to lower the ad rates because of the ratings. And uh, you know, I could see, I could, you know, doesn't surprise me. Probably won't be the last thing, last guy that we see do this. Uh, very disturbing poll results again for Monday Night's Wrestling. Um, Raw was better, 39 percent. Uh, Nitro was better, 15 percent. Uh, didn't watch Raw 2%, didn't watch Nitro 19%, didn't watch Raw or Nitro 25%. Now, now what that means is is that 44% of our listeners did not watch Nitro, and 27% did not watch Raw. Now, usually, the percentage that doesn't listeners watch Raw... Listeners this show are hardcore fans. You would think. And that's, that's, what's, that's really... But the thing is, uh, let's see, 44% is way high on Nitro, and then 27% is way high on Raw, and so many people didn't even watch either show. So, um, God, that is... Anyway, and coming coming off, uh, you know, that WCW poll from last week with their, on their pay-per-view, uh, not good at all. Uh, let's see. Uh, they had a press conference today in Japan uh, with uh, Mitsuharu Masao and Yoshihiro Takayama, and Takayama is going to go into Pride. And I don't... 
You know, I mean, I guess if, they, if they're putting him in, in like a setup fight or a worked fight, that's one thing. But if he's going to go into Pride, you know, it's like the, you know, one of the top heels in the NOAA group, main event tag team. Um, I, I just, you know, as I said, if it's like against a real opponent, that is so dumb. But I guess we'll find out. Because hopefully everyone in wrestling, in, in Japanese wrestling, learned a lesson from uh, Kendo Kashin. You know, it's just, like, what happened to him? He, you know, it's like he went in there to prove he was real. He got knocked out in two minutes, and he's been dead ever since. And there's nothing, that, you know. I mean, granted, they, they haven't tried to rehabilitate him, but, but, I mean, he comes in the ring and does all his moves, and no one believes anything he does. And you don't want your top heel in that position. <laughs> Believe me. So hopefully... I guess Anoki kind of tried with uh, Sakuraba. In what sense? But he still lost. What do you mean by Sakuraba? Oh, 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 oh but putting Sakuraba against Ken Okashi later? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that was, that was to rehabilitate him. Um, but even that, even that match, you know, that match really didn't have a ton of heat either. No. You know, considering, you know, and it wasn't a bad match or anything. Oh, it was real late in the night, and that was a long, that New Year's Eve show was a long show. Way too long for a wrestling show. I mean, you know, some of those undercard matches were way, way too long. Let's see, WWF uh, debuted this week, number two on the Billboard charts. 177,000 units sold, which is like a ton. <laughs> oh, let's see, we should go and talk about, uh, do I have my SmackDown notes here? Actually, I do not. Where are they? I believe they are right here. Uh, da, 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 da. SmackDown last night from uh, Tucson, Arizona. Uh, Chris, okay, it opened with uh, Kurt Angle challenging either The Rock or Steve Austin. The first one who comes down, he was going to break their ankle in, in a match. So he's getting to be more of a badass. And uh, the first one to come down was Steve Austin. And Vince McMahon made that match and also made uh, Rock versus Regal for the WF title. Then they had uh, Lita and Matt Hardy be Crash and Molly Holly. Um, nothing much there other than, um, you know, Matt Hardy and Lita kissed at the end. They had a thing backstage. Bubba Ray was on the payphone. I don't know if he was calling 1-800-COLLECT or not. And Christian attacked him to lay him out, which set up a match later in the show. Benoit beat X-Pac when Eddie Guerrero helped him out, but Benoit was mad because he did not want Eddie Guerrero's help. Uh, he went clean with a crossface, so all of you fans of X-Pac not doing jobs, well, he did one right in the middle. Clean? With a crossface. Clean. Well, clean or Eddie he helped? Cl Eddie helped a little, but, I mean, it was clean to the crossface. Okay. Um, the Radicals were all beating up Just Incredible to keep him from helping out, but Benoit is in Benoit matter at, at Eddie. Rock beat Regal on a DQ when Angle interfered. Uh, Rock made his own save, uh, clocked Regal with a chair and chased Angle away. Uh, they did an angle, and this actually had probably to do, this was probably an angle, that the, the angle that involved the cat last night, actually, uh, except she wasn't there, where Val Venus had sex with a woman, but the woman, I guess, is not mentioned who it was, because she's not with the company, I guess. And uh, the rest of the RTC beat him up uh, and humiliated him for, a weak, being, for showing weakness. Then they did an interview, and he... Basically did. Now, what was the name of that preacher that did that used to always ask for forgiveness, Brian? It's about a million it was killing out. me last night. I couldn't come up with the guy's name. Jimmy Swaggart. See, like I do the Observer. I spent <laughs> hours. I can't come up with a name. Then I think about it for like one second a day, you know, with, with a good night's sleep. Your subconscious have been working on it all night. It took me one second bringing it up now, and I remember Jimmy Swaggart. I, you, I was asking everyone in the house, I go, who's the guy? You know, who's this guy? And everyone's going, Jerry Falwell. And I said, it's not Jerry Falwell. Anyway, so much for that. And then Billy Graham. It's like, it's not Billy Graham for sure. <laughs> okay, anyway. Uh, Maybe they meant superstar Billy Graham. I think they did. Yeah. Anyway, um, let me just, uh, well, I'll just finish this up, and then we'll head to a break. Let's see. The, um, so they had a six-man tag. It was... Uh, Devon Dudley, Undertaker, and Kane against Rikishi Haku and Christian. And Kane and Devon did the was up spot, which is uh, on when, which one on Haku, which I guess probably is pretty funny. Uh, Undertaker power bombed Christian to win, which isn't funny at all. Actually, very predictable. What a surprise! That that was a sh that's a shocker. And then the main event, Austin and Angle. There's no finish. I mean, maybe a DQ on Angle or a no contest. Uh, Rock interfered. Regal interfered. And they're all, that's kind of how it, kind of how it ends. Uh, Brian, how did the uh, issue turn out? Um, actually, turned out pretty good. Only problem, of course, the earthquake and the uh, power went out of the print shop. But uh, luckily, all I had to do was fold them. And then, of course, they folded the inside page the wrong way, so I got to refold all of them. 
But other than that, just great. Really? You know, I, I probably every week this. something happens, though. Yeah. I want to say this once, but I, I don't know. I just didn't like my issue at all this week. So, just didn't like it. I don't Dude, know you why. were gone all week, though. Yeah, but it's just, that's not that's not the, that's not the pro. I, I don't know what it is. I just um, I mean I got you know all the coverage of the pay per view of the UFC. You know a lot of stuff on the UFC. I just I think that um, a lot of XFL, you know, a lot of W, all the you know all the WF WCW stuff, just seemed like the WCW stuff was just too depressing. Not, maybe that's the word. It's just it's I got so depressed not, too. When I really think about it, it's just so it's so hard. And and all and the guys there, you know, like, you know, when 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 the sale was announced and everything like that, everybody was, you know, they, you know, those those first two shows were good and everybody was happy, and now all of a sudden, you know, between the ratings and the, you know, at the, yeah, the Booker T decision, you know, it, it was the Booker T decision. Just, you know, I, I haven't talked to anyone who didn't say the same thing about it, which was exactly what we said yesterday. You know, so panic. Well, you know, here's the, the basic deal is is that the ratings are going to be horrible. I mean, they're going to be horrible with them or without them. They're going to be horrible from now until uh, everything changes. Whatever everything changes means, and even they never get knows. better. Okay, but but they, but but I mean, the bottom line is is that you just can't react to the weekly ratings right now. It can't be done because they're going to be terrible. Yeah. Well, I guess you could start feuding one of the announcers with one of the coaches. We have not uh, seen if that will work yet, though. Yeah, we'll find out. Uh, I don't think it will, but we'll find How out on Saturday. Sa we'll find out on Saturday. Uh, any more news before we start hitting emails? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, this is a major, this is from Tim. He says, this is a major blow to the WF. It's just what WCW needs to get some viewers away from the WF that watch and just listen to Lawler. It may not be many, but some is better than none. We don't, we don't know that uh, Lawler's going to be able to go to WCW. I mean, it depends on the kind of release Vince McMahon gives him. It depends on a lot of things. Uh, they may make up. You know, I mean, logic tells me that, that both sides, in this case, this is not, now, you know, they could do the hard line on Stacey Carter and all that, and no one's going to miss her at all. But the bottom line is, is that Jerry Lawler needs the WWF because Jerry Lawler needs that uh, big public platform to remain a celebrity. And, and, and I think he's smart enough to know what happened to Sable and all the other people who thought they didn't need the WWF and did. Okay? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, they really do need him because they got nobody else that can do his job. And I mean, I think that that's one of the reasons why he probably felt he could get away with leaving because of that. You know, I mean, I, I mean that to fill that many hours. So, yeah. so I mean, they they could. Logic tells me that they're going to make up. Now, I'm not predicting that that they will, but that's just what logic would tell me. So, uh, I'm just trying to think about who would be the next best announcer in line after Lawler, and it's like, who is that? Michael Cole? Oh God, no. Michael Cole and Jim Ross. Well, we'll find out tomorrow. But but the thing is, is but who's next behind Lawler? Taz. Taz. And right Taz. there, that was a huge drop off. Yeah. Or Michael Hayes. Michael Hayes was good in the mid '80s. <laughs> <laughs> he was. So was uh, Hogan. No, actually, no, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. What but, the hell uh, talking about? <laughs> but Greg Valentine was. Yes, Greg Valentine. <laughs> uh, let's see. This is from Chris, who says, "I know why the WF wanted Lawler out of the out." It's clear now we're going to get a press release on how the reason for the ratings decline of the XFL was Jerry Lawler's commentary, how it turned off sponsors due to his comments about the cheerleaders. Yeah. And then he goes, wouldn't it be funny if Honky Tonk Man came in as the, co the color man? Yeah, it would be. Actually, in a weird way, that would be funny. Tom Zink. <laughs> no. Doors open. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you, everyone's going to mention Heenan. That's right. Hey, if, if, if he can go through a year like Friday... Then that'd be the choice, but uh, I don't know. I mean, he, he didn't do it in WCW, that's for sure. It's from Tom Green, who goes. You know, I want to make one comment about Heenan real quick. Um, you know, Heenan, he was talking about how he was never really happy in WCW, in WCW, even when, even like during the hot period. So you really can't blame a decline in announcing at the end because the product got bad because he didn't like it when it was hot. That's I think right. Just getting burned out and working with a horrible crew, and you know, year off, a couple he months didn't off. Care. He, he didn't care. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll see. Plus, he was so uh, frustrated with like the backstage politics and everything like that. I don't know. Uh, think maybe well, WWF's a better fit for him. Who knows? 
It's been a lot of years. Yeah. But, you know, the bottom, the bottom line is is that whatever year that was when they got rid of him, 93, 94, I mean, they got rid of him because in the, Vince thought he was too old. Among, you know, um, also his contract was high. Uh, there were a lot of reasons that they got rid of him then. And it's like, you know, he's eight years older, seven years older now. Yeah. Whatever it is. Seven years older than Lawler. Yeah. Which ain't that much, actually. Yeah, but Lawler, you know, I mean, to Lawler's credit, he I mean, Lawler's, fif 51. Lawler's 51, but Lawler really doesn't act like a 51-year-old, whereas Heenan, you know, when he makes references, you know, there are all those references to <laughs> stuff that, that like, happened in the 50s. 50s and 60s, you know, like Ozzy and Harriet and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, Lawler at least makes, you know, modern references. Yeah. You know, it's like the movie that came out last Friday as opposed to, um, you know, Gone with the Wind or something. Okay. Uh, this is from Thomas Green. Let me think about this one. Uh, just look at these names. Okay. Who would win out of the following eight wrestlers? Who do you think would win a shoot tournament? Okay. Whoever was the luckiest, but we'll, we'll try to do a better thing. Naoya Ogawa, Scott Steiner, Rick Steiner, Masato Tanaka, Kurt Angle, Ron Waterman, Brock Lesnar, and Taz. Okay, first of all, um, Naomi Ogawa, no submissions. Got a little bit of stand-up. Um, Scott Steiner's Silver medalist. Scary. What? Silver medalist. Silver medalist in the Olympics, but that's nine years ago. Uh, Scott Steiner is very scary. If someone had stamina, they'd beat him. Probably too big. Rick's, yeah, Rick Steiner. Rick Steiner... Um, no. Masato Tanaka, no. Ron Waterman, maybe. You know, Ron Waterman's competed in it the most recent. Decent wrestler. How did he do? Not, you know, he's a mid-level guy. Yeah. Not, not, not... I mean, if he went in there with Kurt Angle, Kurt Angle would take him down. I mean, like, you know, no problem. And, you know, I mean, it's, Kurt Angle's a million times better wrestler than Ron Waterman. But, um, I mean, Kurt Angle is, is, is not schooled in submissions or finishing. Mm-hmm. Um... I would guess of those names. Brock Lesnar hasn't been out that long. No, no, Brock Lesnar. I would say I was. That was what I was say. I would say Brock Lesnar of all of them would be the best wrestler because again, because he was wrestling, you know, only a couple months ago. Which Kurt Angle hasn't wrestled in in uh, you know four years, five years, four and mm -hmm. a half years. So I would say from pure wrestling, if all these guys were in a wrestling tournament, Brock Lesnar, I would think would win. Um, Ultimate. Ultimate's a little different. I would say, what, Ogawa, Lesnar, and Angle would certainly... I mean, put it this way. How does the Angle, Knock get in there? I don't know. Well, Taz is in there, too, so what is... You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, how'd he get in there? Uh, you know, the myth. The myth. The myth of... So he didn't show Paul Varland. Yeah, yeah, right, after Missy <laughs> Hyde slept with Paul Varland to weaken him. Not even to weaken him, to get him to agree to do it. <laughs> weaken him? <laughs> oh, boy. What? To weaken him. That wasn't, yeah, that was stupid. That one will, Wait. uh, you'll never live that one down. Okay. Now, I once heard Dave I? say that uh, Paul Varlins was weakened. In his I fight didn't mean, <laughs> mentally weakened. <laughs> he said, okay, I'll do the job. <laughs> uh, if Perry Saturn does a run-in, <laughs> I'm not going to do it clean. That's right. Uh, let's see, now where were we? Uh, Bruce Mitchell's on the line. Let me see, let me just figure this one out now. Am I really going to try to, let's see, Kurt Angle, Brock Lesnar, Naoya Ogawa. Okay, here is my feeling. If they had time to train, Kurt Angle, because he's the smartest and quickest to adapt to things, showing pro wrestling as an example, that Kurt Angle would go to a train with the right guy who would be Frank Shamrock, okay? And Kurt Angle, with that training, would come in in shape, and he would win, okay? So, but if they were going in tomorrow... I would say... Ogawa. Ogawa. Yeah, yeah, Ogawa, because he knows submissions, and, and, and Lesnar and Kurt wouldn't know how to defend the submissions once they got on. they take him on the ground, and then Ogawa would figure out a way to submit him because they wouldn't know how to... They wouldn't be able to avoid the submission. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ogawa, Ogawa, if... Um, um, yeah, definitely, I'd say Ogawa, Ogawa tomorrow. That was a long time for that question. We've got Bruce Mitchell on the line. Bruce, what's going on? What's going on, guys? Hey. Ah, gosh, I don't know. Uh, what do you think about Lawler? Um, well, I mean, I, I'm up to date as of, I just got in from work, so I'm up to date as of last night, but, uh, it, it's interesting. I don't know who the, I don't know what candidates are out there to take his place. And it depends on why, too, and it depends on whether it's just, you know, a tantrum and they'll, they'll kiss and make up soon. I don't think they're gonna kiss and make up right away. Yeah. I don't think. Um, 
Yeah, you know, and it's 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 basically Lawler doing it out of loyalty to his wife. Right. Um, you know, I don't think there's any real heat with Lawler, but he's not. You know, unless they take her back, which they won't do, because they're not going to back down. You know, it's it's it's, it's that same thing that you know that happened with with uh, I, I, I really with a low sense... level player. Well, I mean, I sense this as, as something very similar to what happened with Vince McMahon and Jesse Ventura 11 years ago. Yeah. You know, it was like you know again, Vince Vince and Jesse did at that moment need each other because it took Jesse two years to get into WCW. Not that Jesse didn't do hasn't done well in the world since then. And you know, hell, you know, Vince put Heenan in there and didn't miss a beat. But, um, you know, the the fact is, is you have two guys who, you know, Ventura is not going to back down. I mean, that's that, you know, for whatever we're going to say, if you you get Ventura in a, in a thing, he won't back down. And Vince is is not going to back down. So in this one, I think you've got a situation where Vince isn't going to back down. Lawler might, but he's not going to do it quickly. Right. Well, you know, the other thing though to me is Lawler to me has always been about the, the money. And, you know, to me, and I wonder whether he doesn't wake up in a week and go, oh, man, I want the money. Um, not over the wife. Yeah. Uh, that's, the, but if, if there was no wife involved, I would think that that, that would, would this probably never would have happen. happened. Well, none of this would have happened, that's right. But, yeah. I mean, you, you, you have a situation where if you have, and again, I don't know. I don't know what she's saying. I don't want to, you know, put something in people's mouths that isn't there, but just the pressure if she's, if he's trying to show loyalty to her for whatever reason, um, she has to agree for him to go back, and she really was fired, and probably is pretty upset about it. Right. So that makes that that makes things pretty difficult. Well, that's true, but she may be more upset when her um, sugar daddy doesn't have as much sugar. You know, I mean, I hate to well, it's kind of a mean way to put it, but well, you know, Waller, you know, Waller's made a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know his financial situation, but he was never a big spender or anything like that. Um, I got a, you know, I think Lawler can go along, you know, he can go for a long time before they're going to sit there and be worrying about money, you know. So, and it's not like Lawler can't go to Memphis and get, you know, like endorsements and things like that for, you know, to carry him for a year or two. Right. You know what I mean? You know, coming off of this TV, and it's not like he probably, you know, there's not, it's not like I don't, I would expect that his phone will be ringing off the hook for a while just because, you know, he was a big time player on New York TV, you know, whether it's for TV ads or for independent wrestling dates, you know what I'm saying? Well, you know, he could always do the independence. He's been doing that anyway. He could right. do more of that. Not that that pays great, but I don't know. I don't think he's going to be destitute anytime soon. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I didn't mean to be destitute. I'm, just, I'm sort of like you get used to a certain amount of money, and then all of a sudden you're not, you, have, you don't have that money coming in, and you, you're about the money. I could see where that would put some pressure. But um, Absolutely. You know, you're right. It depends, it depends on a lot of things. It depends on how upset she is, too. Yeah, it's a hard. It's a hard one to read. Uh, let's see. Let's get some more email stuff here. Uh, can you see Bobby Heenan on an XFL game? Oh God, he would be terrible. You know, one thing. So was Lawler. You know, you guys were talking yeah. about Bobby Heenan. I was listening. Um, you know, there's the other thing. I'm trying to think of a way to say this, but you know, Bobby Heenan had some problems that Jerry Lawler doesn't have, and you know, they they didn't get all that much better in in WCW the last couple of years, and that that would be a factor too to me. I think that's the main factor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Second, is Summer is SummerSlam still in San Jose? Uh, is, yes, it is. Um, okay, it was listed on the WF websites. Now it says to be announced. Well, maybe I'll check on that. Uh, let's see. I hope that WF Judgment Day in Sacramento shows the WWF that the fans here are great and it should be a regular TV venue. I mean, the problem with doing TV out here is it's an absolute pain for everyone involved because they got to fly from the East Coast to the West Coast and you lose a day of work. Uh, if they do the TV out here, like if you do the TV, I mean, and they come out here a couple times a year, and you know they were in Tucson last night, but I mean, like, if you do the TV in Washington D.C. or Baltimore or Philadelphia um, after TV, I mean, the guys who are working in the office, I mean, they're back in the office Wednesday morning. You do the TV in, uh, you know, like in Los Angeles or Sacramento or whatever, you know, on the West Coast, they're not back in the office till Thursday, and these guys. Take my word for it, and not just you know Ross where it's obvious and Vince where it's obvious because of all they're doing. All of these guys are so incredibly overworked, and that losing a day of work during the week, I mean, my God, when you're overworked and you lose a day of work by your flying across the country, it sucks. <laughs> it just sucks. Uh, let's see. I think that if Jerry Lawler decides to stay distant from the WF, he won't be badly off. He's a legend in the business. He doesn't need the WWF. He doesn't need WCW. He's rich. He'll always be respected, and his career is fulfilled. 
That's what a lot of people think when they first uh, get fired or leave. You know, About, uh, six is, months later, they change their tune. You know, wrestling's so transitory. Fame and wrestling's so transitory. Yes, he is a legend in the business, but to these fans, he's the funny guy on Raw, and if he's gone, he they'll forget him. Um. Yeah. No doubt. <laughs> Uh, let's see. This has to do with pro with Japanese wrestling and Chris Jericho. A while back, he wrestled in Japan during his stint in WCW. I watched tape from New Japan Wrestling, and Chris Jericho wrestled a super liger. I was wondering if he did some sort of an angle running leading up to this, and whether or not he did so on other occasions it was fun to watch. Being that Chris really sells the match as if he was liger, he used all of liger's trademark moves. And besides his gold locks and his voice, which you can pick out, his style was totally modified to be liger style. Great stuff on an awesome New Japan card. Um, New Japan didn't like it. In fact, they never even put that match on television. The, when when Jericho was going to go there to feud with Liger as um, you know the Super Liger or whatever it was, and and he did the one match at the Tokyo Dome. They didn't like it, and he was never used in that role again. Just the next year. We got a ton of emails with suggestions for the new WF color commentator, which we'll talk about in a second. Bruce, before we go on, where do you see wrestling in a year? Um, in trouble. Because I think that I think the sick, not the cyclical nature of wrestling, but the cyclical nature of fads. WWF has gotten a lot of exposure. Vince McMahon's gotten a lot of exposure, and not such good exposure as XFL. And there doesn't seem to be, except for Kurt Angle, that r really great wrestler to sell tickets coming up. That you know, even Rock and Austin are going to start going down. And just well, the, you know, the, the, other thing with, the other thing with Rock is, you know, Rock, and a lot of people don't know this, but Rock's goal is to be out of the wrestling business in three years. I'm not surprised. I, I really you know, and, and go into the go into the acting business. Right. I mean, that that's his goal. Whether he can achieve that or not, but that is his goal. Well, that's not a you know, in a lot of ways, that's not a bad goal. But I mean, they really you know, you've got that. So I wonder if the WWF can sustain it, and that's the key question because uh, the economics of television now just make it so hard for anybody else to come in, and you've got a lot of veteran wrestlers and wrestling personnel who are veterans at failing and not necessarily succeeding. So. I think it's going to be tough, and I know you and I talked about this before, but um, if UFC could could reestablish itself and get back, you know, get back on get back on pay per view and get a you know get some sort of place on cable television, then maybe we'd have two very different types of companies, very different type of contrast to go to. But I mean, I just think the industry being one company is kind of a scary prospect. You think WCW will be dead? I think WCW is dead. I think they don't know it. I mean, I think WCW is going to be dead. And, you know, I don't know what it's going to be in a month or six months, but it's dead. I wonder what the economics are with WCW. So dumping all the contracts of the, you know, when they run out, you know, a year, year, year plus, right? Yeah. When, 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 these big, when, when these big money deals, not renewing those guys, letting those guys go to Vince McMahon if he'll take them. Some, and if you take some of them, it's going to hurt them anyway. But uh, and then going with the young guys, running four nights a week in a regional area, not expecting much at the gate, but doing it almost like you know it sounds so backwards when I think about this. But you know, a low budget thing, and then just try to produce good television and, and get good creative angles. You know, I mean, you know but what? Who's doing this? Fusion? Turner? <laughs> Whoever owns it, you know, whoever owns it, you have to have some discipline in doing that. I mean, not, you couldn't be like. But you, I mean, you, 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 know, you no can't, you cares. can't. I mean, the whole case, you can't pay guys more than say a quarter of a million. Yeah. And and that would be the top guys, and most of the guys would be making, you know, a hundred, which is, I mean, like they're not going to make it on the independent level, so they're not, you know, I mean, they're not going to. They have no they're not choice. Gonna, they're not going to go to. They're not going to be able to um, make with what they make in WWF and just make that basic thing that you know we, you know, I mean, we're not we, we're not equipped to lose. You know, you know. Yeah, the, the, the I know what ECW did though, and look what happened. Yeah, they lost all their talent. You would, no, in doing that, you will lose all your talent. You know, as soon as they get hot, they're going to go to the other place because there's more money. Now, oh, then I'm I, saying like I'm the thinking, small regional territory, the young guys, the you know, um, syndicated well, you know, TV you or whatever. Them for, you sign them all at the beginning. You know, you start your company. You sign all the young guys that you want for whatever three or four year thing, and at the end of the four years, either you keep them or, or let them go. Either you either you've grown your company the way you can, you know you can afford to give them raises and keep them up, or you haven't. And you know you've got a you're gambling in three or four years that somebody's going to break out, 
and actually be a star and have some star power and be able to sell some other things and get some more revenue in there, and then you can start raising salaries. And if not, it's kind of a moot point anyway. I I'm just looking at how, like, ECW, I mean, they didn't, it didn't work out financially, and it really didn't have anything to do with their guys being taken. It was just, it didn't work. Did yeah, they ever make any money? You know, um, I, I think there was a period there where, um, I don't know if they were ever... Maybe a uh, little far, bit. I don't know if they were ever really profitable. No. I mean, that's the thing. You'd have to run, you'd have to run a good product that people could get into. You'd have to, you know, you'd have to have some discipline, and you couldn't drop angles, and start things up and stop things up and run it like, you know, we've seen wrestling, wrestling promotions on the cheap run. You'd have to really, you know, we're going to do this right at this level and then hope that it hope that it took off. And, if, you know, if it's like ECW and the approach just didn't take off when it got on TNN, when it got on pay-per-view, it didn't grow. And you'd have to hope the thing would grow. And, you know, up against the, the glitz and the glamour of the World Wrestling Federation, that's, that's, a, tough, that's a tough call. Well, I mean, that, that, that's the big problem with the, the, with, with the, why the landscape is so different now from 1981 in doing 1981 wrestling is, is there's there's a World Wrestling Federation with all those stars who really are stars who ha are on that great produced television, and that's your competition. And unless you look competitive with them, because they have so many hours of television, the wrestling fans are just going to watch the other guy's television. And I think yeah. that's one of the reasons why WCW's... And it's one of many reasons why WCW's ratings have gone down. The other is it's just people... Just, I'm obviously we're frustrated with the storylines, no payoffs, and and you know just the whole product in general. Yeah, I mean, not, yeah, they've yeah they've had two things going at them at the same time. Um, it, the cancer from within, and then they just you know WWF has been so good, and you can see it. I mean, it's why it's hard to get, it's why it's hard to sell independent wrestling tickets or whatever because you turn on your television and there it is, you know, there it is on the air free. You know, great stuff, great production values, payoffs, all the rest of it. You follow the whole thing. Here's another. Here's, here's we got we got a whole bunch of emails. I'm gonna go through these as far as names of color commentators potentially. Jim Cornette, you know, if they begged him to do it, he would do it, but he would be very unhappy, and I think he I, I think it wouldn't work out because he would be un so unhappy doing it. Yeah. He doesn't want to leave Louisville. He's he's ha he's you know he'll be on the Monday, greatest I'm job sure. in the world. He's got the, he's got his ultimate job. He he doesn't want to go on, and he he hates flying, and he, he would hate doesn't it want to fly either. You know, he doesn't really That's, like yeah, it. Yeah, he, he, yeah. Yeah, he, I think that some of some of it he doesn't mind now, but because what he you know when he didn't really like the style, that was when Russo was writing it. Right. And that was a different product than now. Yeah, and he yeah, he didn't like that at all. Paul Heyman, I don't think Paul Heyman wants to do it. Uh, you know, and that name's been mentioned a lot. I just don't see it. I think that one's been mentioned a lot. I don't know that it's been a long time for Paul. I don't know yeah. that um, there's ups and downs with doing color commentary. You know what else? A lot of people remember Paul Heyman and Jim Ross. But I don't think they really remember him. I mean, Bruce, I you remember him. Yeah, that, I know. That, that was that that it, it had, they had their good points, but you know, there was times when that was that's a clash of egos that got very ugly at times, and, and, and ugly in the point where you didn't want to watch it because it was it made you uncomfortable. Yeah. And other times they were very good, but it's a you know, Paul, believe me, Paul has his way of doing things, and Jim Ross has his way of doing things, and they're neither of them are very good at compromising their own way of doing things. And their own way of each way of doing things is entirely different from the others. Entirely. Yeah, now, you know, and now it'd be Jim Ross totally established. Paul Heyman, after being the boss and you know answering to Paul Heyman and you know pretty much nobody else, he'd have to be the you know he'd be the the new guy, and that'd be a real tough thing. That'd be a tough. Don Callis. Don Callis. Don Callis. Um, you know, I mean, you never say never, but Don Callis did not leave WWF. With you know, I mean, he didn't have a great experience in WWF. Uh, I got to bring something up real quick. Speaking of commentators, because Ric Flair did it on Monday. It's February twenty eighth. Isn't Flair's contract up? I don't know. Let me check. I thought it was like in February. I was almost sure of it. February, March. I thought so too, but they may have renewed him. You know, while we were all asleep. I hope so, because otherwise they got uh, another Haku on their hands. <laughs> That's true. I'm, I'm sure they have because they wouldn't. I, I just don't see them like letting that. You know, putting Ric Flair on in such a prominent role if his contract was running out that that soon. So That's I kind of what we thought about that. Haku. Nah, but nobody cared about Haku. That's, That's like, true. There's big, there's a, there's they couldn't have put the title on him. The hardcore title, yeah, that really. Yeah. What, a, what a big deal that is. No. Okay, here yeah. is the question: Which match was better, Helmsley and Austin or Benoit and Jericho? They're so different. 
Um, Hensley and Austin. I'll answer that. In my opinion. Yeah, I think I, I think I'll say that too. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty close though. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. If WWF doesn't give Jerry Lawler an unconditional release, do they have to pay him? No, because he quit. They don't have to pay a guy who quits. Uh, let's see. Do you think Vince would rehire Stacy Carter so he doesn't lose Lawler? Uh, no. He just won't. There's a petition out there to uh, bring back Stacy Carter. I don't know why it, it, it annoys me. Bruce, why does it annoy me when I go, <laughs> there's a petition out there to get the WWF to rehire them? There's something about it. It's like, you know. It's like, like, I mean, you know, it's a cliche, but get a life. I mean, no, I, I'm just like a petition. All the issues in this world, a petition to get back. Well, you know, she's going to be fine. Get out of here. Is, is she that oh. entertaining? Is she that oh, good? Oh. Okay, but, you know, the thing is, if there was a petition to rehire the Blue Meanie, then there could be one to rehire Jerry Lawler because of the two. One is one is very valuable, and the other one, you know what I mean? Hey, don't yeah. forget the Bring Back Viscera campaign. Yeah, it's, like, yeah, it's not that good a deal. I mean, it's just not that, but, you know, yeah, it's not, yeah. how much entertainment value have we all gotten out of, of Stacey Carter? With one, you know, with one notable exception, not a ton. So. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Johnny Polo. <laughs> Actually, that's not the worst choice of all. Mm -hmm. You know, he's he could be if, if if they had him. That is not the worst choice of all. I think he'd be better than Taz. He's done some stuff on SmackDown lately. Yeah, and I, I think he would be better than Taz. I was really, I mean, I'm kind of up and down on Taz on Heat, but um. Really didn't think he came through on that pay-per-view. I was disappointed in that. Uh, let's see. This is from Jerry. He goes, I just listened to Billy Gunn's new theme song, and Brian's right. It is, on every level, the most offensive and terrible theme song I've ever heard. The WF Music Department must hate this guy. There are people who do. Not as bad as Ass Man. I was about to say, could it be as bad as Ass Man? It's not. Ass Man is worse. But the fact that it's been two in a row for this guy cannot be a coincidence. Okay, what about Joey Styles? Not as a color guy. I don't know. What is this? Styles and Ross would be kind of a strange combo. Yeah. Uh, who in Memphis Championship Wrestling and OVW do you see being elevated to the WWF? I live in northeast Arkansas and Memphis, so I follow them closely. I'd say Sugar Schultz, who I've seen a little of, Rico Constantino. The problem with Rico Constantino is his age. That's going to really work against him. Pete Gass. Oh, <laughs> Pete Gass. Uh, he's got a better body than he used to have, considerably. <laughs> uh, let's see. If Jerry Lawler never goes back, do you think he knows secrets that can hurt Vince? <laughs> you think Vince knows secrets that can hurt Jerry? Um, probably both. Yeah. Pro probably both. Let's go to Chris in Long Island. Chris, what's going on? Uh, hi, how's it going? It's going pretty good. Um, I was just curious about the loyal situation. Do you think, I mean, this might be reading way too much into it, but it seems like if they would just out of the blue release the cat, I mean, when they had her involved in the, an angle they were at least pushing on TV and on pay-per-view, that they sort of knew that Lola would react that way, and this was sort of Vince's way of not, like, just coming out and saying, we released Lola or we fired Lola, so that if he quits, you know, he can hold him to that contract and he can't go to WCW and wouldn't have to pay him and all that, or... Do you think it was some underlying just, thing that just, wanted to get rid of Lola? I don't know why they'd want to get I, rid of him, though. That's, yeah, that's the whole thing I, figure I out either. Pe people have suggested that to me, you know, that Vince knew this was going to happen because it's that all-seeing and all-knowing Vince who can predict everything perfectly, you know, right. giving him more credit than he's worth. But I, I don't see why Vince would want to get rid of Lawler. I now, think, obviously, obviously, he probably had a very good reason, and I, and I don't know what it is. I, you know, I have suspicions as far as um, getting rid of getting rid of her because all the you know all the other women don't like her. Um, and oh, that's just, why they just, get rid of her. I don't know. I don't know that. I just know that, that that the other women don't like her. That may not be why they got rid of her. Oh, okay. they, I mean, there's. They probably have a. Put this way, because of Lawler's position, they, I don't think they were going to fire her unless they thought that it was somewhat important to fire her. I don't think they would just do it on a lark. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, they don't know. You know, Lawler doesn't seem to know why she got fired. She doesn't know, seem to know why she got fired. But, I mean, I, I mean, I just don't see them doing. You know, you know, you know what I mean? It's like. They, they weren't using her much before anyway. They could just send her back to Memphis, and she could work those angles in Memphis and everything yeah. like that, and it would be just like it was before. Um, you know, again, again, you know, Lawler pushed for her to get more TV time. I think that the other women probably didn't like the fact. You know, it was the same thing with China, though, when China first came in. You know, China was with Hunter, so China got a lot bigger of a push than some of the other women. You know, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, 
Who knows? I thought it was her God-given talent. Well, it just seems yeah. kind of weird, too. I mean, like, the timing, too, because with WrestleMania, like, a month away, about, I mean, without not, with not having Ross and Lola there, I mean, I can't see them with their most prominent pay-per-view just looking like, oh, we're going to go with Ross and Taz or Ross and Cole or Ross and whoever. Unless they had... I mean, and I'm sure everybody's speculating, so I'm not saying this is what it is, but unless they had some kind of deal where they knew they were getting Heenan or somebody like that, who seems like the guy everybody would kind of want to come in and fill a spot, unless they had a guy like Heenan well, just can, lined up. They, they, can, they, they can get Heenan any time, but if that was the case, why were they... I mean, they didn't even return... You know, after the first phone call, they didn't even return his phone calls to Heenan. You know, it's been, you know, it's been a couple of months. Okay, I, I, I don't know. That's what I'm just saying. It just, it just seems so weird with the timing because be, with Ross and Lola being such of a, like a... a, a a cornerstone of kind of the royal program, just you know what I mean? They're just there, you know, and everybody's just so used to it. I don't see somebody just jumping into Lola's spot, even with the little bit of push they've been giving Taz on the shows recently while Ta- while Lola was in the ring, you know, I guess maybe to see what he could do. But it just seems weird that it, it seems to have happened almost in a two-hour period, too, because according to those reports, they were done with the one meeting by 2 o'clock, and then at 4 o'clock, you know, yeah. they had the... uh the decision already, like out of the blue. Yeah, we let Stacy go, you know, and obviously. He was I got gonna... a feeling that decision wasn't out of the blue. Oh, I don't think so either. But I mean, for the way it was positioned, like, I mean, there was nothing sort of hinting to this. You know what I mean? At least according to Lola and Stacy, unless they're just not telling us, you know, more than they already know. That you know, they might deep down know why this happened, but I don't know. Oh, they know deep down why it happened. Okay. Don't don't get no. They they know why it happened. Okay. Um. um... The other thing too, the the story about the WCW about the fusion deal maybe going like falling through. How much do you think that's uh, how, you know, what do you think the odds of that actually falling through are, and then somebody not picking up the company, you know, some other buyer. Uh, there there are reports that it might fold or something. Anything can happen as far as the deal falling through. I mean, like a, a week ago today, it, it looked bad. Right now, it doesn't look bad at all as far as it falling through. Um, there are other people interested in buying it, although those people have not spoke, been, you know, like, you know, Brad Siegel hasn't talked to anyone once this thing went into whatever it was, you know, before the closing and everything. Once that announcement was made, and even long before the announcement was made, I mean, he, they hadn't negotiated seriously with anybody. I mean, and, and people had called up that were interested, and, and he didn't return. I mean, it was like, you know, he was going to, I think their idea was they wanted to protect it and, and sell it to a, a wrestling company. They were either going to sell it to Eric or to Vince, and Vince, you know, couldn't buy it. So it left Eric, and I think, and they really didn't care. They, you know, they really didn't uh, acknowledge anyone else that wanted to buy it. And uh, as far as what happens, um, you know, if if they don't, if they don't, if this thing were to fall apart, just totally fall apart in the next couple of days, I think that they would probably get some other offer from someone rather than fold it. But yeah, who knows for sure? Because yeah, uh, there was some story that we, I think it was Wade Keller on one of the websites. They said it came from Wade Keller saying that. Uh, being that it's the 28th, that the deal is uh, like a kind of a big snag, and that uh, you know the, the date's not a big to... the date's not a big deal, but there was a, there was definitely a big snag last week, no doubt about it. But, but they worked but... out that snag, that particular snag, or what? That that snag that they had that that's been worked out. That's not still that's, there. That snag that snag's been worked out. That's not to say there's going to not be another snag tomorrow, but that snag's okay. been worked out. Uh, let's go here. Somebody suggested. Um, Ahmed Johnson to replace Jerry Lawler. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. That's a very good one. That's He's really available. Good. What about ooh, <laughs> What about Mark Madden? He's available too, and he would take it. Um, In fact, I think Mark's very really upset that he hasn't gotten the phone call yet. Um, I don't see it working out. Just knowing how they think, I don't. Yeah. I just don't see it working out. Yeah. What What about Kurt Hennig? I never really liked Kurt Hennig as a color commentator. So, you know, uh, let's see. Uh, how about Shawn Michaels? Oh, I hated Shawn oh, Michaels as a commentator. That wouldn't be the uh, best idea. Oh, he'd, be, no. he'd be explaining why everybody wasn't as good as he was. <laughs> what do, do you think of Pete? Do you think Pete Rose will be a part of WrestleMania this year? For some reason, I hope so. It's whenever I see it, I both am happy and sad because I always find it just humorous. You know, for some reason. But then it's sad because, like, you know, as a kid, I actually watched Pete Rose and he was a hell of a baseball player. And it's kind of sad that he, like, you know. How about Kane as the commentator? Somebody's already suggested that one. I didn't remember want to that? Remember about, uh, it was like two years ago when Kane didn't even speak. I'll never forget this. And then he they came down to do commentary with Paul Bearer, and they put the headset on Kane, and he didn't speak, <laughs> so he just sat there. You know, he would be the worst choice, to tell you the truth. I mean, obviously, it doesn't work with his, with his gimmick to have him sitting out there 
by Snow <laughs> No, he does when he did it. He did it a little while ago. <laughs> he wasn't the worst guy. Uh, let's see. All reports on the Jerry Lawler, Stacey Carr situation say that the cat was not a popular figure backstage. Why does he have so much heat? Um, if you ever hang around a whole bunch of beautiful women at the same time, not that I've ever done that, but I'm just oh. I've heard. Okay, if you ever do that, you would understand that it just doesn't work, and especially when one of them is getting more of a push than the other, largely because of the influence of her husband and not because of her talent, it's guaranteed nuclear heat. And she had it because of those, you know, because of that reason. It's guaranteed. Whether she deserved it or not, and again, I don't know, I don't know, but whether she did or didn't, it's just, you know, you're, you're going to get it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got all those women that are sitting like Terry Runnels, you know, going like, you know, how come, how come she's getting a push? You know what I mean? When, when I'm more over than she is, you know what I mean? Or, or, or Jackie probably going like, hey, you know, I can actually wrestle. You know, why is she getting, you know what I mean? It's just, it's just, you know, it, it's just the situation. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. How come the WF stopped their tradition of induction of wrestlers to the Hall of Fame and Slammies? I think they like the access thing the best. You know, and you're not going to. I think that's the Hall of Fame thing just sort of didn't work because it's such a, their Hall of Fame was such a friggin' joke, you know? I mean, it was, how can you have a Hall of Fame without, like, Billy Graham and Bruno Sammartino and Hulk Hogan and Roddy Piper? You know what I'm saying? It's, it's a the joke. Hall of There's more the Hall of Road agents. Yeah, exactly. So, so you know, I think, I think that, you know, just every year they had the Hall of Fame, especially now that fans are a lot more sophisticated, um... It, it, it was like, you know, how come you don't induct Bruno? How come you don't indu induct Hogan? You know what I mean? Or Billy Graham? And they'll just never do it because they're, you know, they're they're what they are. <laughs> what can I say? You know, it's like it's a, it's, it's you know, Vince isn't going to induct his enemy because it's, you know, you know what I mean? It's unlike, like in a sports hall of fame, you know, like, uh, I don't know, if, if the commissioner of baseball hated one of the players, but the players belongs in the hall of fame, they're not going to just go, hey, you know, all your writers don't vote for him. I mean, it's just, he's just going to be in. And wrestling, it's just different. It just made it a joke. And Slammies, you know, Slammies was, was, I just think that the access thing was a lot more fan friendly. The Slammies was just sort of their, in, it was like their inside joke anyway. If you look back at those, they're pretty horrible. Some of them were really bad. And they're, oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Tommy Rich won the belt on a Monday in Augusta and then lost it back on a Thursday or Friday in Athens or Gainesville. I think it was a Friday in Gainesville. I never understood if they were going to do the title change. Why didn't they do it at the Omni? Now, that is a good point, and that I don't know. You know, I always heard what the, uh, there was some deal that they wanted to prove that that the title could change somewhere else besides the major venues. It, it could change somewhere else besides, besides the Omni as some sort of effort to get, like, Augusta, I mean, to get, like, um, all the little towns across the country or whatever, you know, all the all the towns that they ran during the that's, week. Something that's like that. Pro anyway. That's probably what they were thinking. Yeah, that makes sense. I, 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 maybe I can find that out. Anyway, let's go to Frank. Frank, what's going on? Dave, how's it going? Yes. It's going pretty good. Hi, Bruce. What's up, Frank? Long-time fanboy, second-time caller. Yeah, boy. And Only calls when Bruce is on. I'm sorry? <laughs> Only calls when Bruce is on. That's right. I'm his idol. I, no, I'm your idol. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I get confused on that. <laughs> I, I wanted to apologize for not letting you get a word in edgewise last time. And uh, I thought I'd make it up to you this time by letting you choose the topic of the phone call. XFL. <laughs> yeah, I can see this is trouble already. All right. Your, 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 two, your, two, to your two topics were, uh, do the Freebirds belong in the one Hall of Fame? Or, as, uh, as Dave has already said, the XFL. <laughs> of the two, I take the Freebirds. I'm sick of the XFL. <laughs> All right, well, we used to be sick of the Freebirds, but that's another story. <laughs> yeah, when Jimmy Garvin was on the team. Oh, God. Oh. Oh, God, yeah. Well, that, that was one of the reasons why I thought the Freebirds were, were an interesting sort of uh, test case when you talk about groups going into the One Hall of Fame because you've got a really unstable lineup almost from the, from the beginning of the, of the group because you've got Gordy and Hayes for the first uh, year or so, and then uh, Hayes basically inactive because of the injury and, and Buddy Roberts coming in and it being Roberts and Gordy. And then, of course, they do the... They do the split in Georgia where Hayes and Gordy are on opposite sides of a of a tag team feud with uh, Jimmy Snuka and uh, I think Otis Sistrunk. Is Otis Sistrunk for one week. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. That was a long-lasting one. That's, that's one of those Marquezine legends where it, it, it seems like it must have been bigger than it was. But, <laughs> he was um, just there for like two weeks and then he was gone. 
Yeah, yeah, but but the pictures live on forever, like like Tommy Rich's uh, one week title reign. <laughs> so so you've got that with the with the lineup, and so the question becomes, uh, how exactly do you count it if you if you want to count towards you know accumulating certain uh, milestones for for Hall of Fame eligibility? Do you get to count any of what all three of them did as singles or or while they were teaming? Do you only count them when they're in combinations with each other? You know, Dave, I was kind of curious as to what your thoughts were on some of that. Okay, my thought is it's Michael Hayes, Terry Gordy, and Buddy Roberts when any two of the three were together, but anything Terry Gordy did with Steve Williams or in Japan doesn't count. And okay. anything Michael Hayes didn't do <laughs> after after the Freebirds broke up isn't held against him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, now one, of the, one of the other interesting things about this particular uh, case is you really don't have the major title. I mean, they won they won the tag title in Georgia when it was sort of a, a quasi national title, but other than that, they they didn't get uh, a WWF world title or an NWA world title. They they held that six man title in world class, but that was basically created for them and and the Von Erichs in that feud. Well, to me, it's not so much what what title that they have. I think that I think that that incarnation and yeah, that changed all the time um, definitely makes it because of a lot of the influence that they had, and they were they were very good, and they sold a lot of tickets in different places. But you look at you look at New Orleans and the thing with the junkyard dog and the blindness angle, then coming into coming into Georgia and just what an impact, um, and, and Dallas too, what an impact that the rock and roll part of their act had. Um, you know, you saw, I mean, that really spread everywhere, and it still we still yeah, see, it preceded the WWE today, huh? It proceeded what the WWF did. I mean, I, I don't have any doubt that, you know, one of the things that Vince McMahon did when he was coming up with this, you know, stuff out of nowhere was, you know, watch those Dallas TV shows because those Dallas TV shows were years ahead of their time. And it was like, well, here's a bunch of stuff that we can copy that no one's seen outside of, that no one, that I can tell everyone I invented. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, and when they were, when they were in Dallas feuding with the Von Erichs, particularly the first time, and even, you know, when they came back a couple of times, that was a major, major thing for its time. And then they went to Georgia, and um, they weren't. They were part of a kind of a team of wrestlers that were hot. But when Georgia was hot, the Freebirds were a major part of it, or a major spark to that. Um, you know, you, you move it on. To me, that Freebird team deserves, um, and it, you know, had influence for a long, long time. A lot of the three-man, you know, the three-man team as a factor that. Um, you know, they really had a lot to do with that. They uh, they just changed a lot of stuff, and and you know, they really it was a component of of, of three guys who were more than the sum of their parts, and not less than the sum of the parts. You know, I mean, they really had a magic together. I, I you know, I it, think it they, seems, I think it they seems like the, the, the rock and roll legacy was a, a bit of a double-edged sword, though, because using the using the, the hip music like uh, Freebird by Leonard Skinner to try to draw more, perhaps more mainstream people and, and more young people into wrestling was a good thing, but then they turned it around and gave us the flip side with, with Michael Hayes' masturbatory attempts to live out some kind of a of a David Lee Roth fantasy with, with all of their other music videos. And those videos seemed to kill their heat in the in the different territories where they tried them. Well you know, I, I you know, I I'm probably gonna embarrass myself here and maybe I won't, but I always thought and I listen to rock and roll music or followed it long enough followed wrestling, but I mean, I always I like Bad Street USA. Let's, let's just say that. I, I don't think that Bad Street USA hurt them at all. It was yeah. just one of those things where, you know the problem with the Freebirds is, is that um, they were out there the free, welcome. The Freebirds as an, well first of all, when Terry Gordy went to All Japan, I mean that was the heart and soul of the team because he was the worker. Right. And then Buddy, you know, Buddy got old, you know, because he was already old when it started. And, then, and, and the thing with Michael is that Michael Hayes couldn't be effective once he looked old, and Michael Hayes started looking old when he was still young because he lived so hard. And, you know, Michael Hayes passed 30. I mean, he never did, you know, I mean, he got pushes in WCW and stuff, but really he never did anything. Yeah, he you know, was, I mean, yeah. Hey, Michael Hayes is younger than a lot of guys that are main eventing now. A lot of them, you know, and uh, his same age as Sting, for a, as a matter of fact. No, and, you know, and he's long that. since gone from this business as far as, a, you know, I mean, as, as, as an active wrestler. Yeah, and I, you know, I really, and when I say all this about the birds, um, I would love to have the hours and hours of my life I wasted watching watching Jimmy Garvin and Michael Hayes wrestle. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And they were they were awful for a lot longer than the Freebirds were were um, a great team. How, how, that's wanted, not true. How long did they extend Hayes' <laughs> career 
by teasing the reunion that, that really never came to pass. Yeah, all that was awful, and that is kind of a mark, as a mark against them, but I still just think the influence and the freshness of it when it came through, and the fact that it worked not just in one territory, but it worked, you know, around the country, and, you know, as I said, we still see some of the influence they were very, today. Yeah, they were very influential because, you know, you know, that set the stage for, like, the Fabulous Ones and the Rock and Roll Express and, you know, just a lot, you know, the rockers and just a million of these teams that they kind of set the table for. And, you know, I mean, Michael Hayes was not, you know, Terry Gordon was the work of a team. Michael Hayes had, for that era and for what he did, a lot of charisma. I mean, he really was, you know, he really was a volatile guy for all that stuff. And, I mean, I think that was, you know, it's like I said, that, you know, Gordy couldn't speak that well, but, but Hayes, Hayes had what Gordy was lacking. Gordy had what Hayes was lacking, and you know, Buddy Roberts made the perfect foil. I mean, I think that yeah, because he had experience, and those guys were all young. You know, the one thing also with with Hayes is, um, I mean, I, I, in that in that era, you know, like you know, we're talking about mid '80s. I think, with the exception of maybe Roddy Piper, Hayes was probably the best heel in the country. Yeah, and maybe even including Roddy Piper, because you know, Roddy, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's whatever, whatever you think. I mean, Michael Hayes' interviews to me were much better than Roddy Piper's. Yeah, he was a tremendous. Tremendous interview, and then for a while, I mean, he he was terrible when they put him back on it again. But then for a while, he was a great color commentator. We're talking about people that that teamed up with Jim Ross. I mean, he, you know, who's going to team with Jim Ross for his time? I don't think it's an answer now, but for his time, the work he did, you know, UWF was he was pretty darn good. The, the other problem that I have when I when I go back over the Freebirds to try to to try to build a case one way or the other is in looking for the great matches. I don't see a really consistent body of work. And some of that is, is the fact that they were in regionals like Georgia where they may have had, you know, they may have had four star matches in the Omni, but we only got to see, you know, a one minute clip on, uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling. So, so it could be partially due to that. But then when I look at some of those other teams that you mentioned, like the Fantastics or the Rock and Roll Express, I see the, the consistency of the lineup staying together for several years. I see a little bit more success at a national level. And then I also see a, a, just a much more solid body of work where you can say, hey, here's the rock and rolls. And, and granted, the Midnights may have been carrying them, but they're having four-star matches, you know, day in and day out for a couple of years there. You know, if you're going by wrestling work, the rock and roll does have a better, um, you know, and they weren't being carried when they were at their prime. I mean, Ricky but, Morton was awesome. Yeah, Ricky Morton was awesome. Robert Gibson was a lucky guy. He was in the right place at the right time. But Ricky, Ricky Morton was, was a great worker for his era. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, but... But I, I don't think that that, I think that it's a, it's a combination of factors that put somebody in a wrestling hall of fame, in the wrestling hall of fame. And, um, if you've got, if you've got several factors that are very strong and you've got some factors that aren't, aren't quite as strong, that doesn't hurt them. And, you know, I mean, I saw enough, there was enough, um, main events on world class championship wrestling that were pretty darn good, that were pretty, pretty far up there that I don't think that wrestling work counts against that particular those particular three, as I said, the other, you know, the other incarnations um, are kind of scary. But this giant stack of emails with suggestions of people to replace Jerry Lawler. And some more. Bill Watts. If it was the eighties. That would be a great choice. Uh, it would scare me to death Holy now. Smoke. You know what? Though I'd like, I, I personally would love to see that. That'd be that'd be quite a for the short term. Show. For the short term, it would be unbelievable. Bill Watts. I don't. He's like this. How would I explain? It? No matter how cruel a person Bill Watts could be, I find him so fascinating and entertaining and, and, and brilliant yet not brilliant at the same time. If that makes any sense. Yeah, that's what it does. Juventud Guerrera. Yeah, there you go. Minutes. There you go. And Bill Stevie Ray. Together. Stevie Ray. Stevie Ray for about five minutes. <laughs> uh, Rocco, the old puppet of Yellow D. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Shane McMahon. Oh, God, I hope not. I hated him as a color commentator. Uh, Honky Tonk Man. David Crockett. Oh, yes. You have to live <laughs> you. Spent ten years listening to David Crockett do Worldwide. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, this is, not conspiracy, this is the conspiracy theory. Regarding Jerry Lawler, it doesn't seem less than odd that Jerry Lawler announces a few weeks that staff cuts are coming. Lawler is suddenly programmed with the RTC and the cat that allows both King and Cat to be written out of the storyline. Actually, actually, it made it even more difficult, if you really think about it. It made it more close. Yeah, how did that write him out of the storyline? 
Yeah, yeah actually put him in the story. She was already out of the storyline. You didn't have to bring yeah, her Yeah, she, she was out before the starter. Yeah. Taz is suddenly pushed again as a color commentator on pay-per-view and Raw. I know we tend to give Vince too much credit, but this looks like it's been plotted for weeks. Why would they want a plot to get rid of Lawler? Okay, this one says, what about Vince McMahon? Uh, I think if it's past that time, I think it wouldn't be good at all. Um, and why is Vince, except for Montreal, ever had to plot to get rid of anybody? Yeah. Uh, Arn Anderson. I've always thought Arn Anderson deserves a shot at being a color commentator because he might be very good. Bret Hart. <laughs> yeah, right. Randy Savage. Oh, he was terrible when he was good. Oh, man. Mick Foley. Mick Foley would probably be really good. You know that's, that? You know what? That's, that uh, of all the choices, I didn't even thought about that. That's not. That's probably the one I like the most. Brian Christopher. And how is this going to affect him? That's. Uh, that's going to be. He worked last up. night. Yeah. I was wondering if the Memphis developmental program, of which Lawler was part, was deemed too stacked and not worth it from the WF standpoint. When Lawler's contract was supposedly up a few weeks back, I thought Lawler's contract's been been was renewed a long time ago. Uh, I figured he would jump to WCW because of his stake in the Memphis Federation. Now that Lawler's gone, the WF has so many contract signees, do you think they'll take the prospects they want? Ship and Bohar Valley, close down Memphis, uh, because I understand that there are two different Memphis products, perhaps leaving one expendable. No one knows, and I've asked, how this affects uh, Memphis. Uh, I'll miss the king, but the cat was as useful to the WF as the state of Idaho is to the United States. How about Joel Gertner? No way, no way. The placement of the six-man tag match on Nitro puzzles me. Actually, it doesn't puzzle me at all. Well, okay, let's see. Why would WWCW try to compete with the first quarter hour of Raw when they've been pulling the lowest Nitro ratings in a long time? That was, without a doubt, the most entertaining segment of the show. After it was over, the, any buildup was lost throughout the rest of the show. The idea is to keep the people from tuning in at 9, and the weakest segment of Raw is the first 15 minutes because people have got it in their head that they can tune in 15 minutes late to Raw and not miss anything. How about China or Walt Harris, if he's still alive? Walt Harris, as far as I know, is still alive and living here in San Jose. Uh, I think it's a little, he's probably about 80 years old, so I think it's a little late for him. He used to do wrestling announcing for in the 60s in this area. Uh, now, he was like one of those Bob Cottle types, though, you know, like too low-key for this era. Wouldn't work. Right, yeah. How about um, Bob I mean, Cottle? He, yeah, like Bob Cottle, yeah. Yeah. China, yeah, I had great, great. Todd Pettengill, yeah, I hated <laughs> Uh, let me see. Uh, it's, a tough, it's a tough question. Uh, the Dusty Rhodes. Again, Dusty was horrible in WCW Holy as a color man. announcer after a while. I mean, Dusty would be okay for a little bit, but not long term. Uh, let's see. More and more Dusty. Two seven guys in different man's booth. No yeah. way. Um, I'll never take the Hall of Fame seriously until HBK is in there. Well, you got to get people to vote for him that were in the business. How about you? Matt Excursion? <laughs> Lee Marshall. Uh, Chris well. Cruz. Chris Cruz would not be the worst. <laughs> he would never get along there, though. No. <laughs> <laughs> he speaks his mind. One thing about Chris Cruz, he speaks his mind too much. Let's go to Matt in Connecticut. Matt, what's going on? How are you? I'm doing fine. Good. Uh, Bruce reads your columns a lot in the torch. Uh, very good work. Uh, Dave and Brian, I just want to tell you, you guys are now my favorite number one duo. You're much better than Russo and Francesa in New York, that's for sure. Who? Wow. Oh, WFAN, Mike and the Mad Dog. Oh, he said, we don't, I don't live in New York, so I don't know these guys. Oh, I know. They're national personalities. I kind of took it for granted. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm any time caller, and I usually uh, try to ask questions that can provoke a lot of uh, you know, comments and, and talk back. Uh, so if you'll bear with me, I've actually got a few uh, few comments to make, maybe one question at the end. Uh, my first thing is about the XFL. Uh, I, You know, no matter what the fate of the league is, and it's not really surprising that uh, NBC would pull the plug because to a major network, $50 million is not a major investment. And after all, they still own the 3% of the WWF stock, even if they, they dropped their support. But think of it in terms of the uh, the, coaching the stock staff. will probably go up. The stock will probably go up that, if they once once they drop this. That's thing. true. That's true. But think of, just think of the uh, coaching staff for a second. They asked to come over. You you've asked the guys who are uh, you know it's head or top assistants in the NFL coordinators and such to come out over and a chance for the head job probably guaranteed that the league was going to last at least three or four years. And now three or four weeks in, they're hearing the league's about to fold. I mean, if you're a head coach, you got to be sick to your stomach right now. Well, you know what, though, the, you you have to know, whenever you take a new job with a fledgling company, 
you have to know it's a risk. You know, so, I mean, what, that's, you know, it's, it's just, it's like, uh, I mean, it's just like, you know, the kids that go to a college and, you know, what if, you know, they're recruited by a coach, the coach can always get fired after one bad season. No, that's right. And, you know, I talk from this from an athletic background. I've, uh, coached college baseball and I've scouted profession, in professional baseball. And, I mean, it makes me sick to see what they're doing to Rusty Tillman. They're making him look like a horse's ass. Yeah, they are. Week they after are. week. And, and, and I don't, I don't think, and I don't, I don't think that it's like, it's like they're doing an angle. And he's in the angle, but I don't think that he is like um, willingly participating in an angle. They're just kind of working the angle without his cooperation, although he's doing it. And I think it's really that's why it comes off so bad. I and, think. And here's a guy who left Jim, left Jim Fossil's staff on, with the Giants. You know, had a chance to play for a ring this year. And he goes over to the XFL, and now he's going to have a job getting a college job again after this thing folds up because of the per public perception of him. Yeah. You know. Um, I know well, you guys Phil Mushnick like, did, Phil Mushnick predicted that one too. That's right. I know you guys don't, you know, like to, to focus on the XFL, so I'll get off that for a second. Uh, my next point is, um, just going back to the 80s, and, um, I think it ties in somewhat today. In, in wrestling, as far as the business goes, wouldn't it make so much, you know, if they could keep the simple things in line, it would make the believability act, aspect so much more realistic. My, my point here in tying it in, in the 80s, when Titan went from acknowledging the, the uh, title changes at a house show right away and putting the belt on the wrestlers the next night and, you know, having it in reality, it, they went to a point, I think it was in uh, late 86 or 87, they went to the point of not acknowledging the title change until it happened on, on their syndicated television. Well, that's how they used to do it in the old days, in the 70s, because I remember the tag team title would change hands um, you know, at TV tapings that would air a couple weeks later, and then the, the champions would still be, the, the former champions would be announced as champions until this TV show actually aired. I mean, and I know it only affects a couple of thousand, you know, they push together, you know, maybe a title change happens in Athens, and then, uh, you know, they may read about a house show result the next night, and the, the, the old champion was still defending the belt. But if you multiply a couple of thousand times 50 or 100 shows, eventually all the fans are going to get exposed to it over time. That's, by 1990, I figured... That's you know what have happened what would have happened in Titan. All the fans would have uh, come to realize that the guy may have lost about weeks ago, but here he is still defending. Well, you know that's yeah. true, but I mean I just think that the business evolved into where people who even watch on television understand, you know, obviously understand that uh, that it's a manipulation. And you know even even back in the seventies, they you know they would I can remember in Mid Atlantic they did some they did title changes in Virginia and in North Carolina. Um, you know, for the different markets, and they would also they would also run. Uh, they uh, they were still doing that in the, they were still doing that in the, in the early eighties. Yeah, in the early eighties, they'd run angles. They might run an angle, say, in Richmond to try out to try out before they even brought it to TV. I'm speaking specifically. I know that they really start. They really did something to turn Rick Flair babyface the first time, and didn't put it on TV. They ran it for the for the Richmond market. And then when it went well, they ran it on you know the rest of the territory. So I mean, kind of a there's, test. There's all that you know. There's all that. Um, manipulation. Yeah, that kind of stunk when they did that, just because it, it seems so slow with technology being faster and you know do, with the information, you know, being information be able to get a, get around in the 80s a lot faster than, than in the early 80s or the um or the or the 70s. But I think you know, I, I mean, it hurt, but I, you know, obviously it didn't hurt that much more. And you know, you have to remember too, they were marketing the, they were marketing the kids a lot more than they, than they are now. I mean, they're marketing well, the teenagers. The, the other, the other thing too that you got to remember in, in that era is that the people who promoted wrestling had incredible disdain for their audience, more so than uh, even now, I mean, more yeah. than they probably do now. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes I think that maybe that's wrong because they, they probably in some ways. No, I think so, you hit the nail right on the head. But they really did. I mean, they they thought that their fans were morons. I mean, the people in wrestling in the '70s, and now I think that they think that their fans are. Half smart, semi more half more. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, my last point, guys, and just um, if you could spend a couple minutes discussing this, because I'm always fascinated about this era. But when um, when Crockett started buying up all the uh, the smaller uh, territories, starting with the Central States, uh, UWF in uh, Florida in uh, late '86, early '87, there, um, I mean, they, they had the the capacity to go national. In, in, I mean, with the Interpromotional angles and such they could have run at the time, even though they were affiliated territories. I mean, just the, the marketing possibilities alone. Could Dusty Rhodes? Have, could one man have really screwed up all that? You know what? I'm not. I, I, I was front row, literally, for a, a lot of that um, with Dusty Rhodes, and I can certainly sit here for hours and talk about how Dusty Rhodes destroyed Jim Crockett promotions. But I think what I think the thesis that you're working on um, is very much flawed. I, Central States was. 
a promotion that was had one foot in the grave and you know the other foot in the grave too. I mean, it, there was nothing there for them. C really Central, to sta do. Central states in Florida were dead. Mid South so was wasn't Florida, quite. Yeah. yeah, Mid South wasn't quite dead yet. Yeah, no, um, I mean, those, those two. I mean, he didn't mention it. Mid South is another is another thing, but there really wasn't any marketing opportunity. I mean, they tried to prop it up with some of those C string guys. I mean, Central states and you know in Florida, but um, the one where they had the opportunity. And the one where they made the big, big mistake that I think, it, you know, hastened their demise was was um, was Mid South was was, was UWF. And that's UWF. The there was a market of talent there. The yeah. UWF one could have worked, but the, the the deal with the UWF was, is that you had you had real big egos there, and the two companies. You gotta remember, you had two companies that were competing with each other that were kind of they kind of become rivals, and UWF was kind of the like there were there were three horses. There was the um, you know WWF. There was there was uh, Jim Crockett and there was Bill Watts, and the kind of feeling was like the the, the Crockett guys kind of felt like they were really the, the Vince was a great marketer, but he was promoting something that really wasn't the same thing they were, and we were the real wrestling. And then those guys were beneath us trying to do this, and then to make the feud work, you'd have to put those guys over, and and they just weren't willing to put over guys that they felt were beneath them for so long. It was kind of like the Hulk Hogan Ric Flair thing years later. Um, you know, I mean, we all know that, that when Vince McMahon wa was, was handed the Hulk Hogan Ric Flair feud by her in 91, that he could have done so much better with it, but the reason that he didn't was because of the ego involved of they spent so many years fighting, you know, both Vince McMahon and, and Hogan, the legend of Ric Flair and the legend of that company, that they weren't going to put it over to make money. At That's least over as, uh, and as much as they... To a lesser extent with, like, Ben Juan Hunter. Then they had the... Um... Ben, ben Juan Hunter is, 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 is a good example to a lesser extent. They, they, for, you know, that's right. The first thing they were going to do is beat Benoit, even though there was, like, a big... You know, there was a big money match at that point with Ben Juan Rock uh, handed to them, and they wouldn't take it because it would, it, would, it would give, you know, Chris Benoit credibility that they wanted to give him on their terms, not for him to walk in with. No, that, that's true. I'll, um, I'll leave you on this note because I know you have to get to some other calls. But I think Davey said it best a while ago. I think, uh, and I think it extends more than the past couple of years. I think for, for most of our generation, it's been that those outside the business know it's a work and those inside the business still believe it's real and have believed it's real for a long time. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot for taking my call, guys. Take care. <laughs> bye bye now. That's probably, uh, apropos in a lot of, in a lot of cases. We've got a zillion faxes here. With all kinds of suggestions to replace Jerry Lawler. Anyway, uh, let's see. Let's go to a couple of these things real quick. We'll get to our final group of callers as well. Uh, heard anything more on Rob Van Dam and WCW? If they push him like Shawn Michaels, I think he could be a big component in getting the things back on track. I hope they push him like Shawn Michaels if they get him, just because they got to push somebody. But he's not Shawn Michaels, and don't. I hope no one kids themselves into thinking that he is. But I do hope they push him like that. And as far as um, they can't sign him right now because until the deal goes through, they can't sign a big money deal. Um, I, they've talked. I don't know where, where things are at right now. Is it true Frank Shamrock beat Dan Henderson in 15 seconds? No, it's about 45 seconds, but he did beat him. How about Art Donovan? <laughs> Remember Art Donovan? <laughs> Brian, did you ever see the pay-per-view that Art Donovan did the color on? No. He was um, unbelievable. Didn't he say something about Hogan on the thing? I don't remember. I just remember it was Gorilla. How much does that guy weigh? He's big. Like I said about every single guy that walked, this is in the 80s when everybody was really big. No, I, th I think he really did say, as I recall, Hogan was out of the company and on the out list. And he might have even been in WCW by that time. And Art Donovan said, no, no, I'm thinking about the mayor of Baltimore. I'm sorry. Same thing. Yeah, the mayor of Baltimore, when they interviewed him and they asked who his favorite wrestler was. And he said Hulk Hogan when he worked for WCW. That was great. Yeah. No, that was, that was, remember when, um, was it Tyson? When he said like his favorite wrestler was Bruno San Martino. Oh yeah. yeah, that was funny too. Yeah. Okay, this is from Ray who goes. You're missing the obvious. The whole deal was a work to set up Paulie to take over for the King. Yeah, no, it wasn't. Uh, let's see. What about Brian Bosworth? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Oh god. How about Vince? Oh yeah, Vince Russo. Okay. Mark. Everyone's okay. Okay. Angelo Mosca. Oh yeah, right. Charlie. Mint. Charlie Min. Who's Charlie Min? You don't remember Charlie Min? I, f I don't. Oh, I do now. Now I do. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. Okay. I do remember Charlie Min. Who was Charlie Min? He was a guy. What was it, like in the eighties? Who did it? Like, was like on the C or D show. Yeah. Wow. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
Steve McMichael, Lance Russell. No, Lance, I don't think Lance would want to do that right now. Um, <laughs> he'd probably be better than anyone anyone suggested. <laughs> By far, too. Yeah, he would be. How about Kevin Kelly? Well, they could always do that. Uh, Lord Al Hayes, mm, it's too late for him. Uh, Larry Zabisco, uh, short term, Larry Zabisco would be pretty good, not long term. Bob Backlund, yeah, right. Lou Albano, yeah, sure. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that one, I, I'd be shocked if they ever did that one. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, you mentioned one of the reasons that Cat might have been let go was because of heat, among other women. I was just wondering if you knew if Trish has heat with the other women because of her big push in place of other more established women. As a matter of fact, Trish has the same heat, or similar heat. I shouldn't say the same because I don't know. But Trish has similar heat, yes. Uh, let's see. Uh, what went wrong with Brian Adams' Hawaiian crush role in the WWF? He stunk. All right, let's get to the phone calls. Let's go to uh, Tony in Long Island. Tony, what's up? Hey, guys, what's going on? Hey. Uh, not too much. Was, uh, somebody said David Crockett? <laughs> yes. Uh, I don't think you can go wrong with David Crockett. <laughs> but, uh, somebody mentioned Captain Lou, and I was—I always preferred the three-man booth. And I was thinking, Dave, you, Captain Lou, and Bert Sugar. And Bert Sugar, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> yeah, that's a team. I'd yeah, stay up for awesome. the uh, the replay of the, of of Raw if, if you three guys were doing the. Uh... <laughs> oh my God! And uh, I've got to agree. I guess there's now one other person besides me who finds the Mr. Backlund character entertaining because I loved it. Oh, I mean, I, I found it entertaining that, that day he was on the... Remember he was on the beach and telling kids not to get a suntan? <laughs> oh, I love that. Tell people that he ate marijuana. <laughs> oh, all of that stuff in that era, I, I thought it was hilarious. Just not as a main event heel. Yeah, he was good was... on that live wire show on Saturday yeah. mornings for a couple weeks before it got canceled or whatever. But how about, on a serious note, uh, Stan Lane? He was pretty good on your show. You know the you know the problem is with Stan Lane and I think Michael Hayes too, is that when they if they were actually allowed to be themselves and just I think they would be great because they're funny people and Michael Hayes is really funny great talker, but when they get up there they try to announce like Vince wants them to announce and then they become so phony. Right. Ever... With Stan Lane, he did that. Um, whatever that promo what was the promotion? WXO. Was the family... Yeah, he did, he used every old wrestling cliche it's like it's in his blood he knew every old i mean in one match he could pull out every one of them and he was not very good i mean he had all the it's like he'd watched a ton of wrestling and he knew them all and he just threw them right out there and like it, it really had a dated feel to it i wanted to talk about uh steven regal uh-huh uh you know i tell you i have definitely hit a wall with wrestling for the first time now in many years and uh besides looking forward to some good matches on the pay-per-views uh i have just hit a wall and uh regal is one of the things that i just look forward to seeing every monday thursday and uh, i'll tell you this interesting story when i lived in the city i used to have this public act couple, couple public access channels and on one of these channels in the city they had this really cheesy it was some type of a wrestling show where this guy, I, I guess he, his whole thing was he was a dentist, some type of a wrestling dentist, and he used to have these wrestlers on periodically. What do you know about that, Dave? Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> I mean, this had to be the worst here, character I've ever seen, but he had Regal on. Well, you know this guy, Dave? Was that you? I think we all do. Was well, no, you, it's not, oh, it's was not that you, me. Dave? No, it's not me. Uh, I don't know. I don't I, know. I was, never, I, was never, I was never masquerading as a dentist. Did he have a mullet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually he did with black hair. Oh my God, it's yeah. you, Dave. So you guys, <laughs> no, uh, I don't know who he is. What, I don't remember his name, but so I saw this show a couple times, and he had Regal on one time for about twenty, twenty-five minutes, and I said, this guy is probably the funniest guy in wrestling. This is Regal now, and nobody even knows. I guess it was an old, you know, uh, tape. Remember when he was on? Remember when Regal did our show? He, he was, was awesome. hilarious. I know he was like so funny. And I'm so glad that they found something for him to do with McMahon. I think it's a, he's perfect at it. He, he should be, in, you know, he's another one. He should be in a sitcom. He's too good for wrestling. That's what I say. I think he could do regular acting. Yeah, I mean, him and, him and Foley, those guys are like, they're, they're like real, you know, like, the rest of those guys when they try to act are so terrible, but there's a few of them that are really good. 
You, guys, on, I don't know if you guys ever check out C-SPAN at all, but once in a while I'll watch it like late at night, and I'll catch like the British House of Commons where they show all the politicians arguing and stuff. And I swear to God, guys, you guys would appreciate it. You would just think it would be like 500 Stephen Regals doing professional wrestling interviews <laughs> in the parliament. It is just so funny. It is funny. It, it, it is real, too. I mean, it's, it's oh, you've seen it? That, yeah. Strange. Oh, yeah, I've seen it. It's, it's some strange <laughs> television. No, how about, the, how about the Japanese parliament where they really do have wrestlers in there? <laughs> uh, just a couple other real quick things. And something, Dave, you brought it up last week, and it's something I saw about a month ago on a video. It was uh, down in Texas, and Kerry Von Erich was getting ready to have a match in a cage with Al Perez. The match didn't even go down because of a supposed heart attack. The, the Fritz Von Erich heart attack. Fritz yeah. Von, and, and I said, and I'm watching this, and I said, you know, I got to call the show one of these days and find out if that was, you know, real or if that was. Because they said, oh my God, this would, you know, he did a. That was so. That was all an act, huh? That was a total angle. Was that, that was one of the worst angles of all time. That was r right up there. Yeah, and, and, that was, the, and it made it on the local news that they actually worked the, the local news stations into into reporting. Oh, that was that was so like pathetic that. when they covered that as like something real. Was I'm, that, I am not surprised. Was that unusual for that time? To do a shoot in, thing like that? As far as doing an angle like that? Yeah. Um. That was pretty. Yeah, well yeah, the, the, fa the, pretty fake, the fake. The mm -hmm. fake heart attack um, to that level, I mean, in that period of time when that angle was done, um, they, a lot of people were really turned off. I mean, people in wrestling that, that usually don't get turned off by wrestling angles, I remember, you know, a lot of promoters going like, you know, you know, all those, you know, after all of his kids died, for him to be doing that, you know, that was, that was a bit much. Yeah. Um, I still think that the Gonzalez angle with Onita was, was the worst of all time, though, if I had to pick one. Two last things. Uh, somebody recommended... Uh... Abdullah the Butcher as a guest. If you uh -huh. watched his shoot interview tape, you would never want to hear from this guy. Oh, I said that. I've told that to people. I heard. Before. It is I've, the seen worst the I've seen the tape. tape I've ever seen. Yeah, I've seen the tape, and it's just like there's uh, the one where he just goes, "Tough guy," you know, some, for everyone. What do you think, Kengobashi? Tough guy. You know. He had nothing to offer. Yep. But one guy who I would recommend, Dave, who I don't mm -hmm. think you've had on, mm -hmm. Gandar Akbar. Really. Dave, uh, is... he did an interview about a year ago on that Wrestling Classics uh, website. The mm -hmm. guy would be tremendous on your show. Talking about payouts that wrestlers received, you know, the exact amounts at those big Texas shows, the Von Erich mm -hmm. shows, stories of the, you know, the wrestlers being attacked by the fans, great stories. Uh, I would, would definitely be... recommend them. I, I, you won't go wrong with them. Oh, that's... Well, sure, check it out just anyway over at that Wrestling Classic because it was a great interview. I should try to find uh, how to get a hold of him. That'd be an interesting one. All right, guys, later on. Okay, thanks very much. Let's go to Frank. Frank, what's up? Dave. Hey. Hey, uh, first time call for what it's worth. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I read on the website that you posted that blading had started another sport. I don't know if you want to reveal that in the air, but I know in hockey that you get more penalty minutes if you're bleeding. But they don't blade. I never heard of anyone blading in hockey. No, I know that... Um, a guy bladed him. In, well, I think it was a couple months ago in a soccer game. Was it a soccer game? Yeah, it was in a, it was in a big in a soccer game. One of the the goalie bladed himself. Yeah, that's that's what I was referring to. Huh. Well, I know that like the, those guys when hockey when they get caught in the face they just drop right to the ice and they have their gloves to the face and no one really could see you know their face and I, if they wanted to they could probably get away with it. Yeah, I've never heard I've never heard of any hockey player blading and I would think that that would be you know hockey such a well covered sport I think that that would come out. Yeah. You know. I, I, I don't know. I mean, well, I just, it may be like in a high, well, big game, and uh, because blood causes more penalty minutes. Yeah. So, if, you know, I guess it wants we'll tell to, Madden to tell we'll, we'll tell Madden to use that as a big excuse if the Penguins are in the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> um, moving on, another thing. I know it's a little bit late, but uh, you think it would be ever possible to get an all-star wrestling show? What do you mean? Like, um, just get the best, have the van, fans vote on, vote on the best talent? From you, like, you mean interpromote, inter interpromotional yeah. show? Yeah, just like not, not now. No, no, too much politics involved. Vince isn't going to. Vince doesn't need to work with anyone, and he's not going to. Yeah. Unless he owns it. Unless Vince owns it, everything he wouldn't do it. That's true. And there's nothing. And, and if I was him, I wouldn't do it at this point either. Because years ago, you know, there was there was some lure to it, but there really isn't now. WCW is yeah. just too far behind. And all it does is, all it would do is enable WCW to catch up really quick. And why would you want to do that to your competition? That's true. And now with uh, ECW going, you think the. Uh... You effed up chant will go with it? 
No. No? No. It'll be around for a while. Yeah. You yeah. think there's any way to get rid of that? Stop screwing up. I was thinking, right. okay. <laughs> I was thinking, what if I'm for that. they're having a televised match, one guy that, you know, messes up on purpose, the fans chant it, and he just grabs the microphone, goes nuts, and leaves and gets out of there. They would chant that'll 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 after. make sure that chant stays for about another ten years. Yeah, you you know, so? I remember I remember going to on the ECW arena about five years ago, and they did a, one of the opening match. Um, they screwed up moves on they purpose. They screwed up moves on purpose so they could send. Yep. So they chant that, and then they sent out nine one one and um, Todd Gordon. I mean, it was it was amazing to see they were screwing up moves on purpose to get those fans to do it, and it worked. <laughs> they did. Well, I was thinking maybe you know if the fans thought it was real, thought it was a shoot, that they wouldn't do it anymore. But I guess not. <laughs> No. Um, uh, I might have missed this. You guys might have talked about this, but why was the Austin Triple H match so early on the pay per view? I think that they wanted to give the. Uh, I think they wanted to end with the title change in the final scene of the show, being Rock leaving with the belt. Right. That, so that how was come the big they... image that, that they wanted, and I think that they wanted to make sure that there was time between those two matches, so that the crowd wouldn't. You know, they knew that Austin and Triple H were going to have a real great match because they were going to do the juice and the tables and all that. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want Rock and and uh, Angle with the world title change in such an important match to follow it closely, so they put a couple of matches in between. That's right. why. Um, now, I have my own opinion on this, but what makes Benoit so good? Uh, his intensity, his believability. Um, I don't know. Just he's, he doesn't he doesn't miss moves. He doesn't do things that he can't do. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. true. There's a lot, a lot of things. He's just great. Yeah. All right. And uh, Brian. Yeah. I read uh, that hate mail that you got. Yeah, I got some good ones. I got some good stuff this week. Yeah. I like those comments you made in the uh, conference highlights. Oh, actually, thanks. so do I. They were, funny. they were funny. They were funny. I don't know what that guy's problem, but well, he can't please everybody. So yeah. Who cares? All right. You know what? You know what? I'll tell you the one. The one. Um. The guy who complained about the angle thing, because I read the angle thing in your comments, and your comments were were like really great. Yeah. And the you know in the in that angle thing from last Thursday. It's like, why would you not want to read those comments? It was better than Angle's comments. <laughs> and it's not like everything we put on that website we don't comment on. Right. Like that was it's not like aberration. I don't comment on every friggin' news story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, we got to get running because I want to get one more call in before All right, we go. thanks okay. a lot, guys. Okay, let's go to Mike. Mike, what's up? Hey, what's up, Dave? Not too much. Hello? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, Mike, listen, you're here. Uh, you're on. You know how they were called uh, on Raw on Monday night? They kept calling uh, Trish Stratus, Vince McMahon's very good friend. They got yes. that from Maya Giuliani's girlfriend. Uh, when, when, when it was found out that Giuliani had a girlfriend, he denied it and said, it's very good friend, Judith Nathan. Oh, I mean, so that's where that's from. There you go. I mean, but, uh, you know, they need, they need Russo back in the WWF. I mean, they're hurting over there. <laughs> Vince McMahon, oh, very good Are friend. Are you Russo? <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. And one more thing, Bruce Mitchell, last, I called, last time you were on, I called up and I said that you were like, How uh, did he get through? That the, uh, the, the fans need to, uh, be educated to the, uh, luchador, to all those guys. Those oh, wrestlers yeah. got to adapt their style to fit in here. This is it's not a combination Mexico. of when both. baseball players come over here, they, they got to learn how to play baseball our way. We're American. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hey, hey hold, hold on. Hold on. I can stop, stop. You, but... stop, 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 stop. Okay. When the Japanese, when Nomo first came over, and he had that, uh, what was the name of that pitch that none of them could hit the first time around? How come he had to adapt? To, they had to adapt to him. Well, so anyway, not that that has anything to do with wrestling. I'm just uh, making well, a real point. Quick, let me just say, when El Duque <laughs> and... Uh, Hideki uh, Arabu, whatever his name is. When he came in, when those guys would get, you know, roughed up in the game, they didn't want to give up the ball. They were like, we started the game in our country, we finish a game. They're like, uh, that don't work, at, that don't work here. You know, you yeah, gotta do it our way. You know, El Duque, uh, not El Duque, uh, Hideki Arabu wouldn't field ground balls after somebody would get a hit on him. Someone would get a home run, the next guy would hit a ground ball, he wouldn't run after the ball. They're like, no way, that don't fly here. They gotta adapt what, their style but, uh, here. Like, like I just said with my, with my point on Nomo, what does that have to do with wrestling? Yeah, but they got, this is what we like here. We like the, the big guy, Scott Steiner. You know, we don't like full guys. Well, Scott, Scott, Steiner's yeah. drawing, Scott, Scott Steiner's drawing huge ratings and giant crowds right now. But, uh, you know, we, you guys keep making <laughs> Sorry. excuses for all Bye, these Mike. Guys. Bye, Mike. Bye, Mike. <laughs> you got, he, oh, you know, if, if, if he would have said, if he would have said The Rock and Steve Austin, you know, that's okay. But, you know, you can't bring out Scott Steiner and tell me, you know, like, this is what people want when, you know, he's on top of a company that's dying, you know. I mean, not that Scott Slater doesn't have potential to do well, but you got to you just got to be quicker on your feet, dude. Anybody else, Al? All right, let's get to a couple of emails before we get out of here. Let's, let's more Paul Heyman emails. Uh, let's see. 
The XFL is ruined because Lawler will not do color anymore. He has ruined because that. There are reports that Lawler was bragging he got Cat back on TV and Carter was disliked by a lot of people. What do you know about any of this? I don't know if he was. Ah, I don't know. Um, I mean, he, he did get he did get her back on TV, no doubt about it. Um, I was at SmackDown last night and I was right behind the announcers. Jr. and everyone in the production crew was really pissed. Probably no surprise, but they were really a lot more uptight than usual. This is definitely not. It's not at work. I mean, I can tell you that right now. When I was a kid, Southwest Championship Wrestling was on TV. They had an angle with Bobby Jaggers and the Sheep Herders. I don't uh -huh. think it had ever been so extreme on TV at the time. What did you think of Bobby, Bobby Jaggers? That was one of the great... They did a broken... Was it a broken arm or a broken leg? Broken arm angle where the bone somehow stuck through, and it was a work. Yeah, that's right. God, I thought that that was, was... That was... I don't even know how they did that. We should get... We should get... Uh, Bobby Jaggers on the show, except then we'd have to talk to him for 90 minutes. How about the Sheep Herders? <laughs> Oh, that would be interesting. Hey, hey they, they've been everywhere. They wrestled for 35 years all over the world. You know what? They'd probably be interesting guests. Mm hmm So they might be terrible guests, too, if they were in character. <laughs> uh, Dave Meltzer interviewing the Sheep Herders in character. Yeah, I'd listen to that. If you were in the studio with them, that'd be a hell of an interview. Yeah, I'd listen to that. They'd be that. licking you. Yeah, okay. Now, this is the XFL is likely to move out of primetime next season. Uh, da, 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 da. It lasts. Uh, Bruce, do you think it's going to last? Uh, I don't see how. I mean, I mean, remember, the rem 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 remember how yesterday Scott Sasso was saying about how we haven't heard anything from the affiliates. Yeah. Remember he said like we haven't heard anything about the affiliates being mad. Okay. Well, anyway, this is today. This is from Pat Patton, the director of programming at KRON, which is the NBC affiliate here in San Francisco. He goes, we aren't going to live with these crappy numbers forever. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I heard like yeah the California. Yeah, I heard that the, the West Coast is just really up in arms. I heard that yesterday about it. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it'll catch on or something. But I mean, I feel like the voice of doom today. But uh, like I'm not always. But um, I, how does the XFL turn around? How does I mean we're the lowest ratings on network television in a long, long time? I mean, I just in, in, in the history of prime time, it was uh, prime time. I mean, it was like the that, third lowest in history. I mean, does Rusty Tillman and Jesse Ventura all of a sudden? start to take off as, as this like football angle and people get interested in it. I mean, I just don't see what they can do or, or where it is. I mean, I think he did a great job of getting interest up and people wanted to see it, and then they saw it and they rejected the product. That's, that's and what it. kind of payoff do you get on that feud? Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's Wait, you put them on the field? Wrong. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, do, they, do they get, do they like line up against each other and chase the football down the field or whatever it is they get? <laughs> they, can, they can have a match race. Yeah, a match race. Yeah, that that wouldn't be so bad. Yeah, I'd be uh, that's a that's a dated term. I just killed myself with that one. Yeah, uh, I understood see. it. So there you are. Yeah, let's see. Uh, real quick, uh, let's see. There, okay, NBC showed skiing and gymnastics on Saturday, and the skiing did a 1.7, um, which is lower than the XFL because it was on a two to four. So if the XFL could could be do would do what they do in that time slot, they wouldn't be doing terrible. So that's kind of they only lose thing. 80 million dollars. That's good. Well, now, they're, they're dead. They're dead. Anyway, we are totally out of time. We're going to have Jim Barcelona and Miami Herald on. I want to thank Bruce for joining the show. Well, I'm, I'm glad that Brian's doing real well after the, the quake, which for those of you who tuned in late, we got a lot of emails actually about Brian. Brian's doing fine, and he said that the news reports about what's going on in Seattle are greatly exaggerated. It really isn't that bad. Right, Brian? Greatly exaggerated. Okay. We will be back, and so we'll be back tomorrow at 5.